Hi, this is Roy Samuelson. Welcome to the ADNA Presents. Today, we have a very special guest, Nicholas DeWolf. He is an esteemed executive strategist and former chief marketing officer at major multinational entertainment and tech brands, the co-founder of the Producers Guild New Media Council, and Nicholas is highly respected by peers and sought after as an authority in leadership guidance and industry trends. He has served on the Emmy's Blue Ribbon Panel Jury and worked with or for the likes of Technicolor, Disney, ABC World News, Sony, and SAG-AFTRA, to name but a few. He also never agrees to interviews, which testifies to how much he supports the creative and social importance of audio description. What an honor. Thanks for joining us, Nicholas. Oh, it's my great pleasure. I'm going to start off with my favorite question that gets the conversation going. What do you love about audio description? Well, well, I'm a sighted person, albeit that sight is not what it once was. I'll start with that admission. My father has very low vision, though. And so I guess when I first learned of AD, I wondered if this might be a useful resource for him. Sadly, his first introduction was computer-generated voice prints that made any sort of storytelling experience null and void, muted as it was by a complete absence of nuanced emotion or narrative truth. So he shies away from the concept now. As I'm sure you know, it often only takes one burn to keep a person from a brightly shining flame. So mm. what I love about the caliber of audio description that you provide and advocate for is that as much as I've experienced it, it matches and sometimes even exceeds the creative intent of the original content creator. It lifts up the storytelling, respects the blind audience as much as the sighted audience, and dare I say, it offers another access point to the content that is not, quote unquote, just for the blind. Great narration has enhanced and enriched audiovisual content for decades. So this adds a layer of creative enrichment for those who want it. And I stress, Roy, it should be an option that can be toggled on or off according to the need or preference. But I found myself increasingly impressed by the quality of this additional layer to the creative audience experience. It's funny because I would assume that based on your experience, particularly in the entertainment industry, that there might be a temptation to see audio description as this one more thing that you have to do and something that kind of gets in the way and let's just check the box and get it over with. But you've really illustrated a lot of things that this very podcast is trying to illustrate when it comes to the nuance of the performance of all the roles of audio description. From the, the minute you were introduced to audio description to, to where you are now, was this, a, was this an evolution of these places where you see AD or did it just click for you? Well, it kind of clicked on one track, which I'll, I'll, I'll go into very briefly, but there was also an evolution of understanding for me that the, the place that it clicked was I spent a good portion of my career producing and creative directing online content for the studios and networks. And I constantly faced headwinds with whether it be the production company itself or the creative participants, the directors, the actors, whatever it might be, or the marketing department, the studio, where they saw the digital aspect as this one more thing to do, as you mentioned it, this add-on that was sort of more of a headache than it was a benefit because they didn't understand its value proposition. This was, you know, the mid nineties. You know, I was one of the early people working in that space, trying to convince a whole industry that this was a partner and a parallel value offering to the conventional channels and platforms through and upon which content was being delivered. And they just saw this as sort of a marketing thing to sort of, you know, get bums in seats, but they didn't understand it had a whole other creative aspect to it. And it was only once we were producing really exciting content, such as I'll just name a few of the things I was uh, involved with, Dawson's Desktop for Dawson's Creek, Playhouse Disney, The Secrets of the Sixth Sense for the movie The Sixth Sense. These were major award-winning creative ventures in and of themselves that added another layer of enrichment and value to the audience that they appreciated. And from a business perspective, it drove sales through from feature release through to DVD, through to VOD and POV. And, and just it kept the audience loyal because they were getting this other layer of enrichment that previously had not existed. And it was in a space where they existed. This was a massively growing online audience that wanted to experience that content where they already were. 
and taking advantage of the tools and resources that were unique to that space and platform. So when, in fact, you introduced me to AD, I immediately saw a parallel. I saw an audience that wasn't being served, that wanted to be served in the space they existed, that had value as an audience, that wanted to develop loyalty for brands and content that was being delivered to their cited compatriots, and an industry that didn't know how to do that in a way that respected both the creative content and the audience in equity. And that's where I saw the parallel, and that's why it clicked to me very quickly. After that, of course, Roy, it was a learning curve for me, learning the different types of AD that are out there, learning the different perceptions of what good AD is, both in terms of the final content delivered, but also in terms of the production workflow. So that's been very interesting to me, and I'm still learning in that capacity. Those parallels, you know, I caught myself a few times as you were speaking, realizing that you were not talking about AD in your previous experiences. The, the similarities are astonishing. One thing that I'm coming back to, if, if I'm hearing things correctly, that without the awareness, there's a lot of assumptions that were built into the, I guess, the culture, that things were the way they were for a reason, and anything that, that comes along that's not that way there's a lot of things, usually negative assumptions that come. A lot of the work that, that we've been doing together has helped me find the words and find the language and, and find the approach that is supportive of what I would call the win-win in many different areas. Your guidance as a strategist, as a, as a guide, has been instrumental in, in some of the best progress that audio description has made, and I've been honored to be a part of it. If we could pivot to talk about that experience, just uh, working with you, I'd, obviously I'm I'm singing your praises here, but I'm I'm curious about your experience in in working with me. Oh, it's been nothing but a headache. No, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it, it, it's, it, it's uh, you know you mentioned earlier on that I don't like to do interviews, and uh, and it's true. I I'm uncomfortable doing them simply because I take greatest pleasure working with people who have something they're passionate about and helping them realize that passion in a manner that either generates revenue or uh, awareness or exposure or enriches the communities in which they live and or work. That's something I've grown into because obviously conventional wisdom is that we must all make lots of money, become rich and famous and noted in our own uh, respect. So working with you has been a joy largely because I'm learning about something I still know next to nothing about. And learning how vast the blind and low vision community is, how diverse it is in and of itself, how, how rich it is in its already existing accomplishments and its aspirations. And so it's a whole world, if you'll forgive me from, from sort of segmenting it, but it's a whole world that I'm having a, a really wonderful time exploring, learning about, discovering. And through you, I've met other people in that community who really have taught me a lot, both about the industry I work in and, and you know, society in general. But one thing it's reinforced for me is the entertainment industry and the media industry are businesses. And creatives tend to lose connection with that because they are creatives. They are passionate about delivering the riches, creative expression, whether it be of their own narrative vision or their own talent. And so when they come up against an individual or an organization that says no to them, they see that as a negative. And one of the things I've worked with you on uh, is that it's not a negative. We have to understand in much the same way as I suspect often people within the blind community say no to something the sighted community is trying to ram down their throats. I suspect the blind community is not trying to be negative. The blind community is saying you need to understand the priorities in my existence, in, in my presence in this space. And once you understand that, then we can work together, respecting each other's often separate priorities and finding a channel through which we can both travel so that those separate priorities can be equally respected and fed. So the business of the entertainment and media industry is about making money. It's about maximizing shareholder value. It's the challenge that is being faced right now 
between the NPTP and SAG-AFTRA and the WGA. Absolutely, writers and actors deserve to be paid fairly for the work they're doing and to be assured that their identities, their talents, their images are honored, respected, remunerated, and not treated as some sort of replicable product with no remuneration. I don't think secretly and privately anybody in the AMPTP or studio or network community thinks otherwise. The challenge that we have to accept is their responsibility primarily as they have been taught and conditioned is not to the creative community. The creative community is a resource. It is a tool to help them fulfill their responsibility, which is to their shareholders. And this is, I believe, somewhat of a problem within our society as a whole, where vast swaths of MBA graduates have been told, taught, and conditioned that that's their only responsibility. And that so long as they're maximizing shareholder value on a short-term, quarter-to-quarter basis, they're doing a great job. The problem is that's not sustainable. And you see many, many businesses get overtaken by more innovative businesses who understand there's a way to do this so all priorities are respected. You look at people like Matt Damon and Ben Affleck who are creating this production company that starts off saying, we need to pay the cast and crew fairly and make them participate in the profits right off the get-go. That's the sort of innovative thinking that is going to circumvent established systems in the entertainment and media industry and risks leaving them behind in the same way that entities like Facebook, when it wasn't a behemothic conglomerate and the like, circumvented the media and entertainment industry like the AOLs and the like, who were sitting there going, no, but we have to make money short term. That's it. We need to start listening to each other much more. And the studios and networks, the AMPTP, need to be willing to exercise the degree of professional humility that allows them to listen to their actors, their writers, their blind audiences. These are all the same constituents. Entities that have influence to bear, that have a unique perspective of great value, that if acknowledged and respected, can only lift up and enrich our industry and our market, will not damage it, will not crush it, will not dissolve it, and will not devalue it, can only enrich it. Listening to, acknowledging, and respecting those voices does not mean you have to do what they say. We all have different perspectives, but if you're not even willing, willing to acknowledge and respect and listen to the voices, you're stuck. And when you're stuck, you're not moving forward. So that's my perspective for what it's worth. And it's worth a lot. That listening and collaboration comes up a lot in not just in audio description, in the multiple areas, whether it's uh, the audiences, people on the blindness spectrum, the people that are also involved in the filmmaking and the AD, that all of these things are are integrated. And to hear the global perspective that it is, <laughs> there's some similarities there as well. Maybe this is a good time. And by the way, for for our purposes of this podcast, we're recording this in early August, 2023. I'm curious about you sharing some experiences that you've had, maybe a challenge in your own business that you're really proud that you overcame? It's one of my favorite questions. Well, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is maybe not so much business, but it's business related. Um, I've gradually learned to stop listening to conventional wisdom. I mean, our industry, in fact, our society as a whole is swamped in divisive traditions to which we all subscribe, whether by force of habit or under pressure from all that surrounds us. Uh, first that comes to mind to me, ageism. It's the last great prejudice that remains unacknowledged, in my opinion. But for a prejudice to be acknowledged doesn't mean it's being adequately addressed. So I admit I derive satisfaction from politely refusing to subscribe to or accept something simply because it seems acceptable. I don't accept that something is true simply because a media channel says so. I seek fact-based verification. I don't accept that we're all equal when there exists clear evidence that whole swaths of our society are still marginalized in one way or another due to race, disability, gender, age, or other markers that don't correlate with capability, performance, or equity. I don't subscribe to the idea that our worth is determined by our wealth, our popularity, our possessions, or our position. In fact, 
I sincerely believe, Roy, that some of the happiest and most fulfilled people in society are also some of the most invisible, supremely contented individuals surrounded by loving friends doing something that brings them joy. That to me is the pinnacle, but the paths we tend to take to aspire to that position are often far more torturous than they need be. And so for me, it's, it's taken me a while, but learning to stop listening to conventional wisdom, I think is the thing I'm probably most proud of. Yeah, oh, so beautifully shared. Thank you for that. Your contribution to audio description is is monumental, and the the gifts that you've given to me, the the outreach that you've done, it's um, it's had an impact. And I can't help but think that many other of your clients have been in similar positions because this is something that this is a reflection on you. Well, that's enormously kind of you. Um, I think if I've done my job well, and I, I've been very very fortunate to receive praise from past clients. The praise is not to me. My job as an advisor, and, I, and I'll tell you how I cherry pick my clients, because I do, I admit it, is I don't have the impact. I am able to help my client, given my experience, mistakes I've made in the past that I help others not replicate, whatever you might seek as the as the solution. I'm able to help them have a stronger impact than they might have otherwise had. It may be that they have this incredibly powerful vision and passion, but they're not able to find the words to communicate it as effectively as they might otherwise. Or they may know exactly where they want to end up, but they don't have the strategy to plan the trajectory to get them there in an efficient way. Or they simply may have an idea, a concept, but they don't know how to develop it as intellectual property or something patentable, trademarkable, copyrightable, or actionable in a manner where they can build a business around that idea that actually can gain traction, popularity, awareness, spread, productization, provision of solution or service. Those are ways I help them. So I'm helping that individual or that organization bridge the gap between where they are today and that shining city that they, in their mind's eye, see so clearly, but somehow are unable to build a bridge to bring others there with them. That's what I do. So in the end, I've succeeded most when I'm not present in the final analysis, because if it's about me, I'm just another one of those gurus slash experts slash influencers or whatever you might want to call them, that they're quite happy to talk all about themselves and how fantastic they are. But when you actually dig deep, you realize they haven't really accomplished much except words. And when we die, those words fritter away and disappear. Uh, I'd much rather leave behind a legacy that isn't so much tied to my name, but to my effort. And that impact is uh, is definitely being felt. Uh, I think about this very podcast, we're probably uh, close to 200, if not this may be the 200th episode. I don't want to quote myself just yet, but that that experience over the last three years of interviewing audio description professionals of all kind, people on the blindness spectrum, people like yourself that are aware of audio description and and invested in it, and also with the entertainment experience, it has it has grown my awareness and knowledge in a way that uh, it's really helped a lot of my own approaches. And I've changed if I could be so vulnerable and my humanity that it's a lot of the assumptions that I've had have pivoted and it's a much cleaner and kinder and not necessarily easier, but better approach that I feel is happening. Permit me to speak to that if I may, Ward, because I, I know some of the challenges you had early on in our association, uh, which was you're too nice. And that doesn't mean you have to be the opposite, but I noted early on in our conversations, a lot of the things you struggled with were because you were unequivocally inclusive. You were willing to talk to and work with anyone and everyone, irrespective of their agenda, their priorities, their aspirations, their ego. You just wanted to give, 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 give. And you still do to a large degree. And I find myself often having to suggest, because it's not my place to force it, but to suggest a course correction, because you put a lot of energy into giving into this community, into supporting the blind and low vision audience and the blind production community, elevating them, supporting them. 
And I took it upon myself, you remember, to do some independent analysis, independent of you, to go out there and talk to people. And I realized that there's a lot of people, there were a lot of people taking advantage of me. And that was one of the first places I told you, we only have so much time on this earth. We only have so much energy. And when you talk about it's now kinder and nicer, and maybe not easier, it's because you finally realize that you do not have to be of service to everybody. We have to surround ourselves with the individuals and the organizations who A, want at least some of the same things we want for the world in which we exist, but B, are willing to reciprocate kindness and generosity with at least an equal modicum of kindness and generosity. Otherwise, it's a waste of a day, it's a waste of a week, it's a waste of a career. There's lots of mean people out there. There's lots of greedy people out there. And we have to wade through those. You know, we have to kiss the proverbial fogs to meet our princes or princesses. But once you identify somebody as being a drain on your energy or your generosity or your talent, it's difficult at any juncture in our career to separate ourselves from them because we always go through our careers feeling less than we actually are. We worry that we're not as good as others might say we are. We're not as talented, that we may not get that next gig if we don't keep working with these people, no matter how difficult they may be. But I firmly believe, as I said earlier, that I don't subscribe to certain conventional wisdoms. I firmly believe that if you have something that you passionately believe in, if you have some modicum of talent, and it's already been proven once or twice, then you hold on to that truth, because it is a truth. And you discard the other influences that are negative and say, look, go be who you want to be. I can't change you, but I simply don't want to be around that energy anymore because I want to move forward. I want to move this vision forward. I want to move this community forward. And I can't do it if I'm struggling against encumbrances, if I'm fighting negative forces. And we shouldn't spend too much time fighting negative forces. We identify them. We push back once We try to see if they're willing to redirect. And if they're not, we say, go in peace. But you can't allow yourself to be chained down by all the negative forces simply because you're worried that they are the forces that control whatever sector you might be working in. They may. They may be powerful forces. But I personally would rather work in and with smaller sectors that are positive and move things forward than larger sectors that stay stuck and eventually, as I said earlier, become circumvented by more innovative and kinder forces out there. That resonates so much. And I'm sure a lot of people listening are are also resonating with, with a lot of words there. I, I'm thinking back earlier, you talked about the priority of listening and that sense of collaboration. And I, I see how that ties together with this approach, that there are so many great supporters in audio description and aligning with those supporters and building them up, not in exchange for, but simply because of that alignment. It's a different feeling. It's a different kind of, it's not, I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine. It's uh, it's definitely that collaboration that that has really resonated. And you've been explicitly clear in, in that since uh, since working with you from day one. The growth of AD quantity-wise, as far as how many shows have AD, is essential and important. And before and since we started working together, I focused on educating anyone who can listen about pivoting away from how cheap AD can be to how great AD can be. As far as the AD audience's immersive experience and, and how powerful that access is, the access to emotional experiences, particularly in TV and film, obviously. So presenting this concept <laughs> has presented challenges. I was curious where you see AD in that sense of the growth of AD, while also addressing the high quality experience that our AD audiences deserve. What's your perspective on these challenges? As I said, I don't subscribe to conventional wisdom. I'm willing to explore everything and anything if it gives me a better understanding of something. So I see AD as a communications channel. It's here to stay and grow. Audio description adoption will inevitably succeed so long as it represents both a creative improvement to the audience experience and a functional improvement. AI voices, computer-generated audio delivery, other process alternatives, 
those don't represent creative or functional improvements to the blind or low vision audience experience. So that's why I admire your tireless push to educate production companies and studios on the imperative of casting the right human voice for the right project and integrating a workflow that will ensure the highest quality of story augmentation possible. That creative and functional combination has been, you know, it's so explicit when it comes to the entertainment industry, specifically, uh, you know, feature films and and streaming series, uh, broadcast series too, that those storytelling elements, the reason that I got into audio description was uh, a, a few dear friends that we could connect and there wasn't that speed bump in the conversation. We could we could laugh about a show that we both love. And that is a form of accessibility. And I'm seeing that the creative aspect of audio description in ways that you've mentioned and, and many more that we've covered in this podcast, the nuances, the uh, the performance, the the timing, the fiddling with the volume up and down. Like if everyone's laughing at the same time, blind and sighted audiences, that's a good sign that the AD is working, that each of these are yet another form of access. And without that access, there is a emotional experience that's being lacking. And again, specifically for entertainment and storytelling, I've, I've said time and again that I've got no interest in voicing someone's calendar appointments or Twitter feed or emails. Like those are straight up informational pieces of information, but you really do address the creative and functional and how those can work together. And it's really yeah. exciting to see the steps that are being taken by, by so many different entities. No, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and I think standardization is a very important component in that because, you know, one of the major obstacles right now to adoption of AD is it's tough to find often. It's tough to know which shows have it, which don't, which platforms or channels have it, which don't. If I go to the theater, it's one type of experience, but I have to ask for it. And I have to sit in my scene, blah, blah, blah. And I have to have this tool. If I go to a film, it's something else. If I'm at home, it's something else. And I may not get the same experience as I had at the theater. So if the quality of service and the delivery of that service becomes standardized so that blind and low vision audiences are assured a minimum level of creative quality, I do predict solid and loyal increases in audience engagement. And maybe that's uh, presumptuous of me because I'm not part of that blind audience, but just seeing how audience engagement grows over the course of my career, I do believe that. If the UI and the UX, the user interface and the user experience for those audiences is increasingly intuitive, accessible and universal, I predict revenue increases, not only for content creators, aggregators and distributors, but also for hardware manufacturers who integrate those offerings into their devices. If content owners opt instead for the cheapest computer generated option or, or distributors and platforms offer AD in an all or nothing proposition as they did with the recent British coronation, I see a rapid devaluation and abandonment. So there's only one thing worse than no access in my mind, and that is poorly conceived access. So that's why I believe that standardization is something we need to pursue. I'm thinking about the digital filmmaking and how that has also evolved from absolutely not to where we are today. That These examples are, are ones that I hang on to. And if I can zoom out on the audio description entertainment side, 10,000 feet and, and see where we're at, it does seem like we're on the right path. Yeah. I mean, when, I, when we started the, the new media council for the Producers Guild, my partner, Mark, he, he was the one that pushed the guild to understand the value of new media as something they should tap into. But then we had the long lasting and uphill battle of convincing them that it wasn't an adjunct add on element and not a redheaded bastard stepchild. It was a equal partner in the production process where we were offering them a resource. And that's, that's what happens when you have something innovative where something that has previously not been tapped into and yet is growing, it can either be ignored and pushed off at arm's length for a while until it becomes so big that it overcomes the barriers and swallows that which has been holding it at bay, or it can be recognized as a wonderful resource and far-sighted, innovative practitioners of the conventional medium 
can recognize it, something there is of value and say, okay, how do we partner? How do we collaborate so that I can benefit from what you're offering? And I think too many people see emerging markets, emerging technologies, or emerging audience communities as a demanding sector saying, I want to be noticed. I don't for a minute, even though that's some of the language that's unfortunately used, I don't believe the blind audience is saying, I demand to be noticed. I don't believe that the online audience in the 1990s was saying, we demand to be noticed or catered to. It's not just a measure of accessibility. That's important. We need to flip that perception. It's that the blind audience and the low vision audience and the audience that wants to hear the story as much as it wants to see it for whatever reason, not always blind or low vision, is offering their customership, their dollars, their attention, their loyalty to those who are willing to collaborate with them. And that message is somehow not quite connecting. And that's what we've been working on together, Roy, uh, and which excites me because I do believe there are people in the in decision-making positions in the entertainment community who are finally hearing that message, that this is not about you have to cater to us because they have financial responsibilities. No, the community is saying we are X million strong. We love entertainment. We love media content. We love stories. We are bright. We are interesting. We are interested. We have stories of our own. Engage with us and the rewards could be enormous. And when you understand that message and start collaborating with that message in that community, the rewards will be enormous. I believe that firmly. And there's been many examples recently where that has happened, that that shift. I, I've loved how you frame that. I continue to love how you frame it, that offering of the resource. I, I think about the difference between hustle and harvest, that this is not a, a shake somebody by the shoulders and pleading and begging that desperation, but it is a, it is that offering of, Hey, this is, this is going to grow and this is going to help us all out. It's uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience? I guess the only other thing I would want to share, and I hope it doesn't cross the wrong way, but it, it, it's not just about blind and low vision people. This notion of sharing, of being willing to listen, it's not exhausting. What's exhausting is always fighting against what others are saying, asking for, offering. That's way more exhausting. What's exhausting is trying to prevent growth, change, improvement. You know, they say change is the only constant. Well, it, it's true. Things will always change. Things will always uh, mutate, metamorphosize, or whatever you know, verb you want to use. We are either going to be able to manage change or we are going to be subject to it. It's okay to be subject to certain types of change when we have no knowledge of how to manage it. I know that the way banks work or the way medical facilities work or bill, I don't know anything about that. So I'm subject to those changes, so be it. I accept that I can't know everything. But in those areas where I do know something, where I have had some experience or where I do have vested interest as a professional, I should be actively seeking to listen as those change agents step forward and express what the future might hold. I should be willing to listen to those messages so that I can be part of the management of that change rather than subject to, and in some cases, maybe even victim to that change. So that's the only thing I would want to add is this goes far beyond the sector you work in. We're, 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 we, so many things have happened to us as individuals, societies, and businesses where we retrench, we, we, we prefer to be stuck in the familiar rather than venture out into the unknown because we don't have the bandwidth or we don't have the funding or whatever we choose to say we don't have. But in the end, we won't have a job or we won't have a business because we chose to keep saying no. Yeah. Thank you. One of the things that's always impressed me about our collaboration together is how we bring different ideas to the forefront and I've got my own perspectives, you've got your own and we work through them and we figure out a way. Are there any analogies when it comes to audio description community, both on the audience side, the 
AD facility side and, and even the, the people who work within audio description itself? Everybody wants the same thing. It's a matter of, do you want short-term gains or long-term sustainable gains? How is the AD community? How is the blind and low vision community and their representatives, whether it be organization or individual, how are they going to work together? Are they going to fragment themselves into divisive little subsectors, or are they going to be open to each other, recognizing that AI is growing very fast? The industry knows AI is growing very fast. They've already committed to accepting that and seeing how they can participate in that. That's a given. And so along come entities that say, well, we can do all AD with AI. And so the short and easy solution is to just use AI for AD. It's short-sighted. It's not sustainable. It will devalue the content. It will frustrate a lot of content creators. And over time, I do believe many content creators will say, I no longer want to work with this entity because they are devaluing my creative contribution. So in time, it'll come around that, you know, somewhere down the road, what you are proposing, this notion of audio description as being a creative narrative experience that needs to be respected and valued equally to the original creative contribution of the director, actors, DP, and the like, that will happen. Whether it happens 20 years from now or two years from now depends on two constituencies. The people who are in charge of the purse strings who will decide short term, no, because we don't want to spend money short term and I won't be in this job anyway 20 years from now, so I could care less. There's a lot of people that think that way. Or they're visionary and say, I know this is going to happen and I want to be part of this change. But the other constituency is the actual providers of the solution. The production companies in AD, the writers, the directors, the producers, the voiceover artists, are they going to be willing to come together, listen to each other, collaborate and work as a unified whole to move this forward in an unavoidable fashion where the industry with which they work says, well, everybody's unified on that side of the table. We need to start working with them. We will all benefit and we can't find short term workarounds because they're all saying it has to be done this way and we recognize it. That's going to be, you know, when you talk about where is AD headed, it depends on those two constituencies. And I don't have the answer for that, that, you know, I don't control either. So it's a matter of them deciding at some point, short term or long term, how, how do they choose to move forward? Thanks for sharing that. Nicholas, where can we follow you? Are you on social media, websites, et cetera? Well, I'm on LinkedIn. Fair warning, I don't connect with people I haven't had a professional relationship with. Um, you're welcome to follow me there if you think it's of any value. And you're welcome to send me a message. You know, if it's something sensible, I'm happy to answer it, of course. I'm also on Twitter. Uh, my handle is at USDEW. And I'm, all, I'm on Mastodon and Threads and you know, Bruce Downloads. Same thing, USDEW. So if you're on social media spaces, look for at USDEW, and I'm likely there. On LinkedIn, you just have to look for my name. But, uh, you know, you asked earlier, who do I choose to work with and how do I pre-qualify them? It's really for me to be able to exercise my professional humility, to be capable of listening to my client, the degree to which I must in order to be of service to them. I need to know in advance that they have a measure of their own professional humility. Because as you well know, I don't stroke egos. I don't say what you want to hear. I'm going to push hard. And I need to know that my client is ready to receive that input and that feedback. I don't ask you as my client to do all that I say, but I ask you to hear it and listen to it and absorb it and acknowledge it and respect it from where it comes, which is the desire to help you grow. I can usually tell within the first meeting, the first 15 minutes, if somebody's in that place. And I've had a number of very, very smart, capable professionals come to me for a 15 minute chat. And I either tell them within 10 minutes, these are the things that need to happen for us to work together. And they're not able or willing to do it. Or we have a lovely 15 minute chat and then I never hear from them again. That's great. That's great pre-qualification. I, I don't want to work with somebody who doesn't get my value proposition so that they can benefit from it fully, because then it's a waste of their money and a waste of my time. And I unfortunately only have so much time. I have 
a number of, of initiatives in which I'm involved that mean a lot to me. And I want to make sure that the clients I work with mean a lot to me too. Oh, that's really clear. Thanks again for being a part of this podcast episode. It is uh, so much to process and think about in so many great ways. Thank you. Thanks for being a part of this. It's my great pleasure, Roy. I'm, as you know, I'm a big admirer of this podcast and everything that you've developed and the library of content you've developed for our various communities. And I wish you continued and increasing success.